last time we went back and reviewed the carbon cycle. So that, that was this uh, portion of it, looking at uh, when we emit uh, carbon from burning fossil fuels, where does it go? How does it cycle around the system? And then today I'm gonna go back and look again at this side of the uh, system. So the uh, energy coming in and the energy flowing out and this um, idea of temperature and the greenhouse effect and how they all relate to one another. So in my two-dimensional topic diagram, I am up here in the upper right. So it's kind of following CO2 into the atmosphere. Where does it go? Some of it stays in the atmosphere. And then that affects the energy budget and global temperature. So we are going to be talking um, more about the greenhouse effect and, and how it affects uh, temperature through this uh, lens of what I'm going to be calling the first law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> the class learning outcomes today have to do with uh, understanding this first law of thermodynamics. And so I want you to be able, after today, to be able to write it down um, in the form of a very simple equation that I'll be showing you, and also be able to uh, articulate uh, what it says in uh, words. So kind of similar to the Kaya identity, it's these concepts that um, can be written as an equation, and so you could actually plug in numbers into the equation but it's also you know, supposed to be just a conceptual way of, of uh, simplifying things. And I want you to be able to use this first law of thermodynamics I'm gonna show you to explain a few things. So you can kind of see that this is kind of a general theory of temperature uh, changes. So we can use it to explain why temperatures warm up in the morning and cool down in the evening, uh, why temperature varies more over land than over the ocean. And our ultimate thing that we're interested in this class is why increasing greenhouse gases warms the global climate. So, you know, we've stated that and, and you've seen that in the uh, readings, but now I want you uh, to be able to do it or be able to um, understand that in, by using this, this very simple uh, equation or theory, um, which I'll call the first law of thermodynamics. And I'll say, <clears throat> I'm saying that I'll call it that because there's kind of multiple forms and multiple ways of thinking about the first law of thermodynamics, but I'm kind of showing you a, a simplified uh, version of it. And so, you know, ultimately where we're going with this, why I'm doing this, is that we want to understand the, the causes of global temperature change, right? The phenomena that we're talking about in this class is often referred to as global warming. And that is fundamentally the first you know, thing that, that increasing greenhouse gases does. It warms the global climate. And so we can see that uh, here in terms of this is a, a temperature in the Northern hemisphere, but you can more or less think of that as um, you know, big enough to be close to uh, global temperature. And we can see temperature varying from the year 200 to the year uh, 2000. And we see that it varies, it goes kind of up and then down on these like 100 year time scales, and then very recently up very rapidly. Um, but there's other variability, you know, on decade to decade time scales. Um, and if you were to zoom in, there'd be variability year to year and month to month. Um, and so we, you know, we want to understand that uh, in, a, in a general level, not just uh, the level of what's going on right now. And so to be even more general, we can think about like, why does temperature on Earth vary in the first place, like vary in space? So this is a map of annual mean temperature which means just averaged over all the seasons at each location on Earth. And we can see some obvious uh, variability in that, right? So the equator is warmer than the high latitudes. And we can see like the hottest places on the planet tend to be over land rather than over ocean. Uh, we see the temperature varies um, in the vertical, so in elevation. It really stands out here with the Tibetan Plateau, which is relatively close to the equator, but very cold. And we can see our other uh, mountain ranges like the Andes and the Rockies being colder than adjacent places at the same latitude. So anyway, temperature varies depending on where it is in space, it varies depending on how far away it is from the equator and whether it's land or ocean. And so we want to be able to uh, explain that. So other uh, temperature variations that we're uh, interested in and uh, that we're more familiar with than global climate change would be like the day-night cycle uh, in temperature. So here's a picture of sunset in Europe. And uh, here's a picture or a graph of temperature um, over some time. I guess this is uh, like 10 years ago, and I think this is in San Jose. And so you can see here's uh, time here, 8 p.m. Uh, going through night. This is uh, sunrise, this line here. So here's a day, and then here's the next night. And here's uh, temperature. And so temperature you know, falls at night, and then it rises. Um, something interesting here is that you'll you'll notice that you know the low temperature 
is not in the middle of the night. So the middle of the night is here, but the low temperature occurs right before the sun rises. And the high temperature does not occur in the middle of the day in terms of um, solar noon. Uh, we don't get the high temperature when the sun is highest in the sky. We get it a little bit uh, later. And so this um, framework that I'm going to be showing you today uh, explains that, helps us understand why, why that's the case. Um, the other you know, major temperature variation that we're more familiar with than global warming is the seasonal cycle in temperature. So uh, summer and winter. Uh, so here's just a graph of the average temperature in, or a map of the average temperature in January and the average temperature in July in the United States. And you know, obviously it's colder in the winter than in the summer. But again, we see we kind of see the same phenomenon where the warmest temperature in the afternoon occurs after solar noon. Um, and the warmest temperatures in the summer occur after the longest day of the year. So, you know, we get our warmest temperatures in July and August, not in June. We get our coldest temperatures in January and February, not in uh, December. Uh, so that, again, will be kind of explained by this uh, first law of thermodynamics that I'm going to be showing you. Here it is in uh, equation form. And so the first law of thermodynamics kind of written out in words is it just says that a change in temperature of something. So it's important to note that that's uh, a change. It's not just the temperature equals, it's a change in temperature equals. And so that would be like a change in time, change in, um, over some period of time, equals uh, the difference between the amount of energy flowing into that thing minus the amount of energy flowing out of that thing uh, divided by the heat capacity of that thing. So I'm just going to be focusing on this uh, equation for the rest of the time. So this will stay up here in the upper right. But I just want to look, you know, a little more detail in each one of these uh, terms and then apply it to some of these questions that we brought up. So first thinking about the energy part, we talk about energy a ton in this class. We talk about it in terms of, you know, energy from fossil fuels and energy, you know, embedded in uh, the food that we eat and energy in this energy budget equation that we're talking about. Um, so we should probably um, at some point just define actually what energy is. Uh, so in physics, uh, energy, the definition, is the ability to do work on some form of matter. And so that kind of introduces two uh, additional pieces of jargon, work and matter. You're probably, probably familiar with matter. Matter is just things, you know, anything that has mass, anything that can weigh and occupies space. So, you know, objects are matter. Uh, work is a little bit more obscure. So work is done on matter when matter is moved. So if you can push something or pull something or lift something uh, some distance, you are doing work on that thing. So this person is doing work by pulling this car. So energy is like a little bit weird. You know, we're like defining matter kind of makes more intuitive sense to us because it's like, you know, a thing that you can hold and is easy to, to grasp mentally where energy is more like what happens to something. It's more like a process that if something is happening, then there must be energy that um, made that happen. So if matter is being moved, then uh, energy is, is what allowed that to happen. And so there's not really like a definition of energy that's like as easy to grasp as, as some of these other concepts in physics. It's more like the results of some process demonstrate that energy was there. So if you can do, if work is being done on matter, then there's, then there's energy involved in that process. So just thinking about the units of energy that we see a lot or use. So the one that you probably don't see a lot outside of this class, but I've mentioned it a couple times in this class is the joule. And that is the unit of energy that's used most in physics. And so it's just a unit of energy. That's, you know, that's just what it is. It's uh, how we measure this ability to do work on matter. And it's uh, just the same thing as something that you would be more familiar with, like the uh, calories in food. So calories, kilocalories, are also a measure of energy. It's just a different unit. So <clears throat> just know that these things are totally equivalent. The joule is not really that foreign of a concept. It's just a uh, a different unit of energy than, than calories. And so one dietetic calorie equals 4,184 uh, joules. And so what we, the, the unit of energy that we usually look at in physical climate science and that, that I've been showing on those diagrams is the watt, which is just the rate. It's a, it's a movement, it's a flow, it's a rate of energy movement. And so that just means that you're gonna take your unit of energy 
and divide it by a unit of time to say that this is how much energy is moving into something or flowing out of something. Uh, and so then you can see up in this equation, that's what these things are, energy kind of flowing in or energy flowing out. So that's going to be, it's going to have like a unit of time in it. So that's what, that's where this watt unit comes in. And watts, we may be familiar with watts from the classic 100 watt incandescent light bulb. So that's just a light bulb that's using 100 joules per second. So it has a rate, you know, there's a flow of energy going through this. And just kind of interesting side note, and because these things are equivalent, you know, dietetic calorie and um, a joule, you can kind of do the math on this and find out that a 100 watt light bulb, um, that's equivalent to something burning 86 dietetic calories per hour. And if you think about people, diet needs are like 2000 calories a day. But if you just said, <clears throat> if you said someone ate, you know, 2400 calories a day, that would be 100 calories uh, an hour. And so that's very similar to this, 86 calories per hour. So that means that people are burning energy at about the exact same rate as uh, a light bulb. So we're all kind of 100 watts. We're all kind of um, sitting around and burning calories at the same rate as a 100 watt light bulb. And so we can, you know, when there's enough people in a room, it, it warms up a little bit, but not that much because this is actually, you know, pretty low energy flow rate. Right, it's not like super hot, like a like a stovetop or something like that. And then the last thing I'll just put on here, um, which is not very relevant for today, but it's just another unit of energy that you will see and be more familiar with is the kilowatt hour, and that's uh, what you'll see on energy bills, kilowatt hour. And that's just a different. It's another unit of energy. It's taking a watt and you multiply it by uh, how many seconds are in an hour, and it's it's a kilowatt, so it's a thousand watts. And it's kind of this weird conglomeration of things, but it's a unit of energy. Kilowatt hour is 3.6 times 10 to the six. So 3.6 million joules. So it's not a flow. If you, if you want it to be a flow, then you say kilowatt hours per month, which is actually what they end up doing on energy bills. So um, turn it back into a flow. But point is just another unit of energy that you might encounter more often than this joule. Okay, so that's just a little, little more on energy. Um, let's look a little more detail at uh, temperature. So I did uh, mention this before, but just um, reviewing this, that temperature, its definition has everything to do with energy. It's the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance, um, which is directly related to the average speed of the molecules in a substance. So this, uh, you don't have to know this, but just um, putting it up here for completeness, that kinetic energy is related to the mass of something times its velocity squared. And so this velocity thing is that speed, the average um, speed of the molecules in a substance. So we think about, you know, we're talking a lot about air temperature in global warming or ocean temperature as well. And so those are, you know, molecules of, of nitrogen and oxygen and um, H2O. And so we're just thinking about how fast they're moving around. So the faster, the faster those molecules move in the atmosphere, the higher the temperature. You can think about, you know, what a mercury thermometer is, right? This thermometer is showing that you have mercury in a tube and that can measure temperature just because mercury, when the molecules are moving faster, it expands. So it goes up the tube as they're moving faster and then you can read the temperature off the outside of the tube. So you need, any thermometer is gonna need to rely on something like this, on, on the molecules moving faster and then you being able to, to somehow convert that into a number. So we did looked at energy, looked at temperature, and then this last one is heat capacity. So heat capacity is just how much energy it takes to increase something, a given substance's uh, temperature. So you can kind of like look at this equation and infer that that must be what it is. That if change in temperature is related to the difference in the energy flows divided by the heat capacity, heat capacity kind of must be how much energy it takes to increase the substance's temperature. And so think about this is what do you think has a higher heat capacity? The left, a small teapot of water, or the right, a large pot of water. Okay, so if you turn if you turn on the burner in both of them, what boils faster, assuming they're both filled up? So I think people get a little bit confused with this concept because heat capacity is named, you know, heat capacity. So it seems like, okay, if something has a high heat capacity, that must mean that it must get, you know, a lot of heat or it must warm up really fast. But you have to think of heat, you have to think about the capacity part. Capacity means like how much heat it can take in, how much heat it can take, right? Um, so something with a higher heat capacity can take a lot of energy and not increase its temperature very much. Something with a low heat capacity 
is going to take in a little bit of energy and increase its temperature by a lot. And so that's kind of intrinsic in this formula that the, it's in the denominator over here. It's not in the numerator. So if you increase the heat capacity, then you're going to decrease any given change in temperature. So the higher heat capacity is the large pot of water because there's more, there's basically just because there's more water in there. So if you start putting heat into both of those, it's going to take longer to raise the temperature of the larger volume or larger mass of water, uh, which has a higher heat capacity, the pool or the cement or whatever this material is, cement or stone around the pool. I think you could, you could kind of be right thinking about it um, in two different ways. Yeah, so I'm not intentionally making this a trick question, but yeah, let's talk about it. So if it's, so let's say it's a super sunny day, uh, what's gonna be hotter, the pool or the cement? Yeah, the cement. And so that would kind of imply that the pool has a higher heat capacity, right? Because the, the sun is shining on the pool and it's, it's shining on the cement, but somehow the cement is getting hotter than the pool. So we're, we're assuming there's, in both, in both cases, this thing is energy in is greater than energy out. So you're gonna get some you know, change in temperature as the sun's coming up, but the cement is increasing its temperature more than the pool, then the cement has like the lower heat capacity and the pool has the higher heat capacity. And that is um, you know, one, one way of thinking about it. And it's because the pool can distribute that energy around all of those water molecules very easily. Uh, the cement, the cement like it can't do that. It's gonna, it's gonna absorb that energy just in the very top of the cement. And so then that manifests itself in uh, temperature changes very quickly. Now, I, that's really the right answer. There's, a, there's another answer which has to do with um, something else called specific heat capacity, which is if you take the heat capacity and you divide it by the total or the mass of that thing. In that case, you would, pr you would probably say that the cement has the higher heat capacity because it's like more dense. There's more molecules in there. Like if you took a chunk of that cement and you put it in the pool, it would sink because it's uh, denser. And so if you really just did like have equal amount of mass of both of those, uh, you might be able to warm up the pool faster than the cement. Um, so that's just kind of a technical aside. Really, for the purposes of this class, you can ignore that and think that, so the higher heat capacity is the pool because it can take in more heat and not increase its temperature as much, where the cement has the lower heat capacity. It's taking in you know, just as much energy, uh, but it's increasing its temperature more. Yeah, even though the cement feels hot on the surface, the cement is colder still all throughout the cement block. Each cement block stays relatively the same. The same. Yeah, so if you were to measure the temperature all the way down to the same depth as the pool of the cement, then it wouldn't have increased uh, all that much. It's just because the cement is not able to distribute that energy down um, all that far. But again, this, that's kind of a, an aside. Like the, the simple way of thinking about it is um, effectively the pool has the higher heat capacity. And so that means it's change in temperature is not gonna be as high. Okay, so reviewing again the type of energy that we're most interested in in uh, climate change class is this uh, energy that we call electromagnetic radiation. So our we have an electric field and a magnetic field and they're oscillating and they're orthogonal and we won't uh, talk about that very much. We'll just kind of state that that's what it is. Uh, electromagnetic radiation, we care about it so much because it's how the sun um, communicates its energy to the earth how uh, it's the only way for energy to travel through the vacuum of space. So it's how, how the energy gets from the sun to the earth. And you know it has several uh, properties, but the only one that we really talk about is this wavelength there, longer wavelengths versus shorter wavelengths. And we talked about that everything emits radiation, everything with a temperature, all objects uh, with a temperature greater than absolute zero or zero Kelvin emit radiation. So anything that you look at, is emitting radiation, um, but you can't see all of them because of these uh, laws that we talked about um, in that previous class, this Stefan Boltzmann law and Wien's law in particular. Uh, the Wien's law says warmer objects emit a higher proportion of the radiation at sh shorter wavelengths than cold objects. And so that's why we can see some things that have uh, wavelengths that our eyes can see, and we can't see other things that have wavelengths that our eyes can't see. And then Stefan Boltzmann's law, Stefan Boltzmann's law is kind of just a, an add-on to this, that all objects are emitting radiation, all objects with the temperature are emitting radiation, but the more their temperature, the warmer their temperature, the more radiation they emit. So we can see uh, Stefan Boltzmann's law and Wien's law in a graph like this, 
which on the left side is the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation that's emitted by the sun. And so on the x-axis is the wavelength, that lambda. And it's the same on both these. And on the y-axis is how much radiation is emitted. And so this um, is showing that the Earth, like this is, this is increasing wavelength all the way over here. And so the Earth is emitting at longer wavelengths than the sun. And you can also, so that's Bean's law. Earth is emitting at longer wavelengths than the sun. It's over here on the x-axis. And then it's also emitting uh, less radiation than the sun. And so it's actually a, a lot, 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 lot less because this access intensity of radiation is 10 to the sixth watts per meter squared per unit of wavelength uh, over here. And over here, it's just watts per meter squared per unit of, of wavelength. So this is like a million times larger, the scale over here than, than this scale. So sun emits way, 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 way more energy than the Earth. So that's Stefan Boltzmann's law and Bean's law in terms of the Earth and the sun. We also demonstrated those two things with this uh, simple experiment of turning on the stove that um, when the stove was off, there's a coil in here, but you can't see it because it's too cold. And then when you turn the stove on, it starts getting hotter. And so you can, um, that demonstrates Stefan Boltzmann's law by the fact that you would be able to feel warmth coming off of that stove. And it demonstrates Bean's law because it's all of a sudden radiating, it's emitting radiation at, at wavelengths that you can start to see. The wavelengths get shorter and shorter as it, as it gets hotter and hotter, and uh, it starts emitting in the wavelength that you can actually uh, see. So on our spectrum here, it was, you know, here's longer wavelengths to this side and shorter wavelengths to this side, and this is colder temperatures to this side and um, warmer temperatures to this side. And so the stove was over here when it was off, and then as it warms up, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it starts emitting at shorter and shorter wavelengths. And the longest wavelength that we can see is red. So it starts, we start to see it um, emitting red radiation. So when things get hot, we start to see them as red. So this was um, something I touched on before, but it's kind of like reviews these concepts is this idea is like, so I just said, you know, red is hot and you can, there's a phrase, you know, red hot. Uh, this is a picture of an Ohio State football game. Their color is red. So a lot of people are wearing red here. Uh, so is all of this red fabric really hot? The red is not being emitted from those jerseys or from those t-shirts. It's coming from the sun. It's part of the solar energy that's coming in and uh, you know, the dyes are filtering it such that only the red is being reflected back to your eyes. Only the red part of the wavelength or the spectrum is being reflected back to your eyes. So that's extremely very different than this picture of charcoal where you also see kind of a red, yellow um, color, but that's being emitted from the charcoal. So if you were to turn out the lights in both of these cases, if this was pitch black midnight and this is pitch black midnight, you'd still see this one, but you wouldn't see this one. I mean, you could, you could even say like a, like a jersey or something that's, that we think of as red, like a jersey or a t-shirt. Like when the lights are off, it's not just that it's red and you can't see it anymore. Like you could say it's literally not red anymore because red, the property of red just means that it's you know, reflecting uh, red wavelengths back to your eyes. And so if there's no wavelengths to reflect, it's no longer red. It just doesn't have a color. Okay, so the whole, the whole point of those laws and everything is to think about why the Earth emits long wave radiation and why the sun emits short wave radiation. Um, and so that's just because the Earth is, is colder, colder than the sun. Um, so one point that's relevant here, thinking about change in temperature of the Earth and energy in and energy out, um, is the kind of neglected uh, energy out term. And so that's kind of uh, exemplified by these uh, couple of pictures. So uh, on the left, uh, we have some people that are kind of overdressed and inside. And so what do we think their change in temperature might be with time? Probably going up, right? And we have people on the right uh, that are underdressed. Uh, so they have, you know, less clothing on than is a traditional in an outdoor environment. And so these people's change in temperature with time might be going uh, down. And so 
But what's the difference between these two uh, in terms of this equation? Yeah, so I would say that we don't necessarily know about energy in, in this case, like, because our, we're producing heat by eating calories and then metabolizing that, right? So we could probably surmise that both sets of people have the same energy in. So let's just put a number on it and say that's five. But yeah, these people have much less energy out. So we could say like these people's energy out is three. And so then this is a, you know, literally an equation five minus three is two. So you have a positive, you have, you know, a change in temperature of uh, two. Of course, these are just made up numbers. It's not a real um, thing. But like, if you, if you kept this at five, you kept this at five, oops, and then you thought about this person, this person might have an energy out because they are not, you know, inhibiting the energy coming from their skin with the coat. Uh, they might have an energy out of, let's say seven. And so now you have a negative number up here. So now you have negative two. So they're gonna be cooling down. They have a, they have a negative uh, change in temperature. And so I, I just point this out because the energy out thing, this is how climate change happens. Uh, that is like often neglected. Like it's easier to think about the energy in term. Um, and you can think about this, like a lot of times we talk about the energy budget in uh, climate class, and it's very similar actually to a financial budget. I think a similar thing happens with a financial budget and what's in incoming and what's outgoing. That if you think about like, I wanna get richer, I wanna get more money in my bank account, that would be like the temperature component. Um, the kind of the first thing your mind goes to is the income component, right? Like if I, if I wanna have more money in my bank account, it's like, I gotta make more money. But you could, of course, just as easily spend less and, and have the same difference in your budget. And so with the change in temperature, it's like, okay, if the temperature went up, that must be because there's more energy coming in. Like it must be like that the sun uh, increased its uh, energy flow. But just as easily, you can reduce the amount of energy uh, leaving. And so that's, that's the difference between these two people's temperature change. It's just that these, you know, the energy is the same, say the heat capacity is the same, but these people's uh, energy out is inhibited. They're, it's much harder for their bodies to release energy to their environment because they have this uh, coat around them. Completing the loop here and, change, and uh, applying this thing to our diagram. Um, remember we said initially there's an energy, or the way that this diagram is, the way that the numbers work out, the energy is balanced, right? So three, 342 minus 107 equals 235. So you have the same amount of energy coming in energy in is 235 and energy out is also 235. And so then this is zero. And then, so it doesn't matter what the heat capacity of the earth is, this change in temperature is zero. Uh, but so in climate change, what's going on is this 235 doesn't necessarily change at first, although it does eventually because we change the ice and we change the clouds and we change a bunch of stuff in the, in the climate system. But at first that's the same. And it's just that when you increase your greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it makes it harder for this to get out. And so this goes down, 235 would become, let's say 230. And so then you have a positive imbalance up here, 235 minus 230 would be five, right? And so then you get a positive number over here. So you get a positive change in temperature. So introducing this equation, you know, the point is kind of to bring it back down to fundamental physics to uh, just demonstrate that this equation is supposed to be you know, helpful. It's a compact way of expressing uh, very basic uh, physical uh, properties. And it's, it's to show that like, there's not some you know, theory for climate change that's different than like the theory of how temperature of, of everything else changes. It's just basic uh, physics of how temperature changes uh, in anything. So I want to now use this equation to think about our, our kind of more familiar uh, change in temperature from day to night. So just the, the question of why do temperatures increase in the morning and fall in the evening? So let's put these things, these individual components of our first law of thermodynamics on a graph here. So uh, this is gonna be time on our x-axis. So we're gonna go night to day to another uh, night. And on our y-axis, I'm going to show both um, energy flows, so our energy in and energy out, and uh, also our change in temperature or our temperature. So first, uh, let's draw on here our energy in component. 
So that is, you know, for our day night temperature, thinking about our diagram over here, our energy in is going to be coming from the sun, right? So what is that going to look like on this graph? It's intuitive, right, from just living in the living on Earth that when the sun comes up in the morning, it's uh, not as intense as basically because it's spread out on a, on a larger uh, surface area of the Earth, and then it's kind of most intense right at our uh, solar noon when the sun is highest in the sky. And so that looks something like like this. You're going to get some peak and then um, back back down. Okay, what about that's energy in from the sun. What about energy out from the Earth? So this this part over here, this uh, outgoing long wave radiation. This one's certainly harder to think about. So over here at night, what's what would is there any value? Is it zero? Like the sun is zero at night. It's going down to zero here. So that was something that I mentioned that all objects with a temperature emit radiation, right? So at night, the Earth is going to be emitting radiation. And then what's the other? What's the what is Stefan Boltzmann's law say? So if the Earth is warmer during the day, then it's going to emit more radiation than at night. And so we can see here. So we have our two components. We have our incoming shortwave radiation, energy in, and our energy out is our outgoing longwave radiation. And so now we have two different like segments where one is above the other one, and then it flips where the other one is above, uh, the, you know, vice versa. So over here, what's the situation? We have our energy out is larger than our energy in. So if we look at because there's a minus sign up here. This would mean, like, let's say this is again three and five. Uh, that would be a negative two. So we'd have a change in temperature that's negative. We'd have falling temperatures. And same, same with over here. When energy out is larger than energy in, then you get cooling. You get negative changes in temperature. And then we have this thing in the middle where energy in is larger than energy out. So if this was five and this is three then you get a positive two. So you get a positive change in temperature, you get warming. So when these two things flip, that's when your temperature is gonna be equal, right? So if these are right here, that's where they equal each other. So whatever number this is, it's the same number as this. So then this is zero, and then your change in temperature is zero. And then the same thing over here, when they equal each other, change in temperature is zero. So here we're not thinking about any changes in, in heat capacity. So if you kind of put that together, this is what uh, the temperature would look like. So you have, when you have your negative imbalance, you have more outgoing energy than incoming energy, then temperatures are falling. When you have more incoming energy than outgoing energy, then temperatures are rising. Uh, and then again, at, at night, when you have more outgoing energy than incoming energy, then temperatures are falling again. And then going back to that Stefan Boltzmann law thing that warmer objects emit more radiation, look at the, look at the shape of temperature and the shape of outgoing long wave radiation. They look almost exactly the same. And so that's Stefan Boltzmann's law, that as it's getting warmer and warmer, the Earth is emitting more and more energy. And it's you know, directly related to that temperature graph. And so this graph should be able, this shows us why temperatures are daytime high temperatures occur after in time, occur after in time uh, later in the day than our solar noon, because temperature peaks when energy in equals energy out, not when energy in is the largest. So it's kind of like, even though energy in is decreasing after solar noon, it's still higher than energy out. So you're still gonna be increasing your temperature until those things uh, cross. And then all of a sudden you have more, more energy flowing out than coming in. And so this is something very similar um, happens with energy budget and the seasonal cycle as well. And why uh, you know July and August are warm are the warmest parts of the year, even though we have the longest days of the year on June 21st. Okay, what do you think would happen if we had the exact same, exact same energy in and energy out graphs here, but we increase heat capacity? So if we increase the heat capacity, so that would be kind of like, instead of looking at it over land, we move over the ocean. So instead of being on the cement, you're over the pool, increasing heat capacity. You're dividing all those numbers by a larger number to get a change in temperature. And so the whole thing, the temperature would just flatten out. So here's our, our uh, lower heat capacity and here's our higher heat capacity. When you increase the heat capacity, it's gonna damp or mute that temperature uh, response. And so this, this becomes important in climate change because the land and ocean warm at different rates because they have different heat capacities. And then that has um, some downstream uh, consequences to that.
but we can see that in uh, just our day night cycle. This is a, a, a animation of forecasted temperature. Yeah, so it starts September 9th and then it's going through these hours. And so you can just see on here the uh, day night cycle that temperatures are changing a lot over the land. You can see, okay, that's the day, and then it's going to night. So here's the day, warming up, going to night, going down, day, warming up. And what's happening over here in the water is much less, it's almost nothing. Um, you, you can barely kind of see the day-night cycle. You know, the point is just that there's the, the ocean has a much higher heat capacity effectively than uh, the land. And so it's not, it's not going to respond as much. You have muted temperature change uh, over the ocean. Okay, so just to uh, summarize that um, first law of thermodynamics is just that equation. It says change in temperature is equal to the difference between energy in and energy out um, divided by the heat capacity of that thing. And we should uh, be able to use that then to uh, explain why temperatures warm up in the mornings and cool down in the evenings. And why temperature varies more over land than over the ocean and also why increasing greenhouse gases warms the global climate.